Chapter 30 I was still sore enough the next day that I had to send word to Cassian I wasn't training with him, or Asriel. A mistake, perhaps, given that both of them showed up at the door to the townhouse within minutes, the former demanding what the hell was wrong with me, the latter bearing a tin of salve to help with the aches in my back. I thanked Asrian for the salve and told Cassian to mind his own business, and then asked him to fly Nestor up to the House of Wind for me, since I certainly couldn't fly her in, even for a few feet after winnowing. My sister, it seemed, had found nothing in her books about repairing the wall, and since no one had yet shown her the library, I'd volunteered, especially since Lucian had left before breakfast for a library across the city to look up anything in regard to fixing the wall, a task I'd been more than willing to hand over. I might have felt guilty for never giving him a proper tour of Valaris, but he seemed eager, more than eager, he seemed to be itching to head into the city on his own. The two Illyrians paused their inspection of me long enough to note my sister's finishing up breakfast, Nestor in a pale grey gown that brought out the steel in her eyes, Elaine in dusty pink. Both males went a bit still, but Asriel sketched a bow while Cassian stalked for the dining table, reached right over Nestor's shoulder and grabbed a muffin from its little basket. "'Morning, Nestor,' he said around a mouth of blueberry lemon. "'Elaine?' Nestor's nostrils flared, but Elaine peered up at Cassian, blinking twice. He snapped your wings, broke your bones. I'd tried to shut out the sound of Cassian's scream, the memory of the spraying blood. Nestor stared at her plate. Elaine, at least, was out of her room, but... It'll take more than that to kill me, Cassian said with a smirk that didn't meet his eyes. Elaine only said to Cassian, No. It will not. Cassian's dark brows narrowed. I dragged a hand over my face before going to Elaine and touching her too bony shoulder. Can I set you up in the garden? The herbs you planted are coming in nicely. I can help her, said Asriel, stepping to the table as Elaine silently rose. No shadows at his ear, no darkness ringing his fingers as he extended a hand. Nestor monitored him like a hawk but kept silent as Elaine took his hand, and out they went. Cassian finished the muffin, licking his fingers. I could have sworn Nestor watched the entire thing with a sidelong glance. He grinned at her, as if he knew it too. Ready for some flying, Ness? Don't call me that. The wrong thing to say, from the way Cassian's eyes lit up. I chose that moment to winnow to the skies above the house, chuckling as wind carried me through the world. Some sisterly payback, I supposed, for Nesta's general attitude. Mercifully, no one saw my slightly better crash landing on the veranda, and by the time Cassian's dark figure appeared in the sky, Nesta's hair bright as bronze in the morning sun, I'd brushed off the dirt and dust from my leathers. My sister's face was wind-flushed as Cassian gently set her down. Then she strode for the glass door without a single look back. "'You're welcome,' Cassian called after her, more than a bite to his voice. His hands clenched and slackened at his sides, as if they were trying to loosen the feel of her from his palms. Thank you, I said to him, but Cassian didn't bother saying farewell as he launched skyward and vanished into the clouds. The library beneath the house was shadowed, quiet. The doors opened for us, the same way they'd opened for Reese when I had first visited. Nestor said nothing only surveying every stack and alcove and dangling chandelier as I led her down to the level where Clotho had found those books. I showed her the small reading area where I'd been stationed, and gestured to the desk. I know Cassian gets under your skin, but I'm curious too. How do you know what to look for in regard to the wall? Nestor ran a finger over the ancient wood desk. Because I just do. How? I don't know how. Amran told me to just see if the information clicks, and perhaps that frightened her, intrigued her, but frightened her. And she hadn't told Cassian, not out of spite, but because she didn't wish to reveal that vulnerability, that lack of control. I didn't push, even as I stared at her for a long moment. I didn't know how, how to broach that subject, how to ask if she was all right, if I could help. I had never been affectionate with her, I'd never held her, 
kissed her cheek. I didn't know where to begin. So I just said, Reese gave me a layout of the stacks. I think there might be more in the cauldron and the wall a few levels down. You can wait here, or I'll help you look. We followed the sloping path in silence, the rustle of paper and occasional whisper of a priestess's robes along the stone floors, the only sounds. I quietly explained to her who the priestesses were, why they were here. I explained that Reese and I planned to offer sanctuary to any humans who could make it to Valaris. She said nothing, quieter and quieter as we descended, that black pit on my right seeming to go thicker the deeper we went. But we reached a path of stacks that veered into the mountain in a long hall, fey lights flickering into life within the glass globes along the wall as we passed. Nesta scanned the shelves while we walked, and I read the titles, a bit more slowly, still needing a little time to process what was instinct for my sister. I didn't know you couldn't really read. Nesta said as she paused before a nondescript section, noticing the way I silently sounded out the words of a title. I didn't know where you were in your lessons, when it all happened. I assumed you could read as easily as us. Well, I couldn't. Why didn't you ask us to teach you? I trailed a finger over the neat rows of spines. Because I doubted you would agree to help. Nesta stiffened like I'd hit her, coldness blooming in those eyes. She tugged a book from a shelf. Amran said Rhysan taught you to read. My cheeks heated. He did. And there, deep beneath the world, with only darkness for company, I asked, Why do you push everyone away but Elaine? Why have you always pushed me away? Some emotion gutted in her eyes, her throat bobbed. Nesta shut her eyes for a moment, breathing in sharply. Because... The words stopped. I felt it the same moment she did. The ripple and tremor. Like, like some piece of the world shifted. Like some off-kilter cord had been plucked. We turned toward the illuminated path that we'd just taken through the stacks. Then to the dark, far, far beyond. The fey lights along the ceiling began to sputter and die. One by one. Closer and closer to us. I only had an Illyrian knife at my side. What is that? Nesta breathed. Run, was all I said. I didn't give her the chance to object as I grabbed her by the elbow and sprinted into the stacks ahead. Fey lights flickered to life as we passed, only to be devoured by the dark surging for us. Slow. My sister was so damned slow with her dress, her general lack of exercising. Reese. Nothing. If the wards around the prison were thick enough to keep out communication, perhaps the same applied here. A wall approached, with a hall before it, a second slope, left rising, right plunging down. Darkness slithered down from above, but the inky gloom leading deeper, fresh and open. I went right. Faster, I said to her. If we could lead whoever it was deep, perhaps we could cut back, right to the pit. I could winnow. Winnow! I could winnow now! I grabbed for Nesta's arm. Right as the darkness behind us passed, and two high fae stepped out of it, both male. One dark-haired, one light, both in grey jackets embroidered with bone-white thread. I knew their coat of arms on the upper right shoulder, knew their dead eyes. Highburn. Highburn was here. I didn't move fast enough as one of them blew out of breath towards us. As that blue fey-bane dust sprayed into my eyes, my mouth, and my magic died out. Nesta's gasps told me she felt something similar. But it was on my sister that the two focused as I staggered back, tears streaming the dust from my eyes, spitting out the feybane. I gripped her arm, trying to winnow. Nothing. Behind them, a hooded priestess slumped to the ground. So easy to get into their minds once our master let us through the wards, said one of them, the dark-haired male. To make them think we were scholars, We'd planned to come for you, but it seems you found us first. All spoken to my sister. Nesta's face was near white, though her eyes showed no fear. Who are you? The white-haired one smiled broadly as they approached. We're the king's ravens, his far-flying eyes and talons, and we've come to take you back. The king, their master, he'd mother above. 
Was the king here, in Valaris? Reese! I slammed a mental hand into the bond, over and over. Reese! Nothing. Nesta's breath began to come quickly. Swords hung at their sides, two apiece. Their shoulders were broad, arms wide enough to indicate muscle filled those fine clothes. You're not taking her anywhere, I said, palming my knife. How had the king done it, arrived here unnoted and fractured our wards? And if he was in Valaris, I shoved down my terror at the thought, at what he might be doing beyond this library, unseen and hidden. You're an unexpected prize, too, the black-haired one said to me, but your sister, a smile that showed all of his two white teeth, you took something from that cauldron, girl. The king wants it back. That was why the cauldron couldn't shatter the wall. Not because its power was spent, but because Nesta had stolen too much of it. Chapter 31 I laid my options before me. I doubted the king's ravens were stupid enough to be kept talking long enough for my powers to return. And if the king was indeed here, I had to warn everyone, immediately. It left me with three choices. Take them on in hand-to-hand -hand combat with only my knife, when they were each armed with twin blades and were muscled enough to know how to use them. Make a run for it, and try to get out of the library, and risk the lives and further trauma of the priestesses in the levels above. Or, Nestor was saying to them, if he wants what I took, he can come and get it himself. He's too busy to bother, the white-haired male purred, advancing another step. Apparently, you're not. I gripped Nesta's fingers in my free hand. She glanced at me. I need you to trust me, I tried to convey to her. Nesta read the emotion in my eyes and gave me the barest dip of her chin. To them, I said, you made a grave mistake coming here, to my house. They sniggered. I gave them a returning smirk as I said, and I hope it rips you into bloody ribbons. Then I ran, hauling Nesta with me, not toward the upper levels, but down, down into the eternal blackness of the pit at the heart of the library, and into the arms of whatever lurked inside it. Around and down, around and down, shelves and paper and furniture and darkness, the smell turning musty and damp, the air thickening, the darkness like dew on my skin. Nesta's breath was ragged, her skirts rustling with each sprinting step we took. Time, only a matter of time before one of those priestesses contacted Reese, but even a minute might be too late. There was no choice, none. Fay lights stopped appearing ahead. Low, hideous laughter trickled behind us. Not so easy, is it, to find your way in the dark? Don't stop, I panted to Nesta, flinging us farther into the dark. A high-pitched scratching sound, like talons on stone. One of the ravens crooned. Do you know what happened to them? To the queens? Keep going, I breathed, gripping a hand against the wall to remain rooted. Soon, we'd reach the bottom soon, and then... And then face some horror awful enough that Cassian wouldn't speak of it. The lesser of two evils, or the worst of them. The youngest one, that pinched-faced bitch, went into the cauldron first, practically trampled the others to get in after it saw what it did to you and your sister. Don't stop, I repeated as Nesta stumbled. If I go down, you run. That was a choice that I did not need to debate. That did not frighten me, not for a heartbeat. Stone screamed beneath twin set of talons. But the cauldron, oh, it knew something had been taken from it. Not sentient, but it knew. It was furious, and when that young queen went in, the ravens laughed, laughed as the slope levelled out and we found ourselves at the bottom of the library. Oh, it gave her immortality. It made her fay. But since something had been taken from it, the cauldron took what she valued most, her youth. They sniggered again. A young woman went in, but a withered old crone came out, and from the catacombs of my memory, Elaine's voice sounded. I saw young hands wither with age. The other queens won't go into the cauldron for terror of the same thing happening now, and the youngest one, 
Oh, you should hear how she talks, Nesta Archeron. The things she wants to do to you when Highburn is done. Twin ravens are coming. Elaine had known, sensed it, had tried to warn us. There were ancient stacks down here, or at least I felt them as we bumped into countless hard edges in our blind sprint. Where was it? Where was it? Deeper into the dark we ran. We're growing bored of this pursuit, one of them said. Our master is waiting for us to retrieve you. I snorted loud enough for them to hear. I'm shocked he could even muster the strength to break the wards. He seems to need a trove of magical objects to do his work for him. The other one hissed, talons scratching louder. Whose spellbook do you think Amarantha stole many decades ago? Who suggested the amusement of sticking the masks to the spring's faces as punishment? Another little spell, the one he burned through today, to crack through your wards here. Only once could it be wielded. Such a pity. I studied the faint trickle of light I could make out, far away and high up. Run towards the light, I breathed to Nesta. I'll hold them off. No. Don't try to be noble, if that's what you're whispering about, one of the ravens called from behind. We'll catch you both, anyway. We didn't have time for whatever was down here to find us. We didn't have time. Run, I breathed. Please. She hesitated. Please, I begged her, my voice breaking. Nesta squeezed my hand once, and between one breath and the next she bolted to the side, toward the centre of the pit, the light high above. What? One of them snapped, but I struck. Every bone in my body barked in pain as I slammed into one of the stacks, then again, again, until it teetered and fell, collapsing onto the one beside it, and the next, and the next, blocking the way Nesta had gone and any chance of my exit, too. Wood groaned and snapped, books thudded on stone. But ahead, I clawed and patted the wall as I plunged farther into the pit floor. My magic was a husk in my veins. We'll still catch her, don't worry, one of them crooned. Wouldn't want dear sisters to be separated. Where are you, where are you, where are you? I didn't see the wall in front of me. My teeth sang as I collided face first. I patted blindly, feeling for a break, a corner. The wall continued on. Dead end. If it was a dead end... Nowhere to go down here, lady, one of them said. I kept moving, gritting my teeth, gauging the power still frozen inside me. Not even an ember to summon to light the way ahead, to show where I was, to show any holes ahead. The terror of it had my bones locking up. No. No, keep moving, keep going. I reached out, desperate for a bookshelf to grab. Surely they wouldn't put a shelf near a gaping hole in the earth. Empty blackness met my fingers, slipped between them again and again. I stumbled a step. Leather met my fingers, solid leather. I fumbled, the hard spines of books meeting my palms, and I bit down a sob of relief. A lifeline in a violent sea. I felt my way down the stack, running now. It ended too soon. I took another blind step forward, touched my way around a corner of another stack, just as the ravens hissed with displeasure. The sound said enough. They'd lost me for a moment. I inched along, keeping my back to a shelf, calming my heavy lungs until my breaths became near silent. Please, I breathed into the dark, barely more than a whisper. Please help me. In the distance, a boom shuddered through the ancient floor. High Lady of the Night Court, one of the ravens sang. What sort of cage shall our king build for you? Fear would get me killed. Fear would... A soft voice whispered in my ear. You are the High Lady? The voice was both old and young, hideous and beautiful. Yes, I whispered. I could sense no body heat detect no physical presence, but I felt it behind me. Even with my back to the shelf, I felt the mass of it lurking behind me, around me, like a shroud. We can smell you, the other raven said. How your mate shall rage when he's found we've taken you. Please, I breathed to the thing crouched behind me, over me. 
What shall you give me? Such a dangerous question. Never make a bargain, Alice had once warned me before under the mountain. Even if the bargains I'd made, they'd saved us and brought me to Reese. What do you want? One of the ravens snapped. Who is she talking to? The stone and wind hear all, speak all. They whisper to me of your desire to wield the carver, to trade. My breath came hard and fast. What of it? I knew him once, long ago, before so many things crawled the earth. The ravens were close, far too close, when one of them hissed. What is she mumbling? Does she know a spell, as the master did? I whispered to the lurking dark behind me. What is your price? The raven's footsteps sounded so nearby they couldn't have been more than twenty feet away. Who are you talking to? One of them demanded. Company. Send me company. I opened my mouth, but then said to eat. A laugh that made my skin crawl. To tell me of life. The air behind shifted as the Hyben ravens closed in. There you are, one seethed. It's a bargain, I breathed. The skin along my left forearm tingled, the thing behind me. I could have sworn I felt it smile. Shall I kill them? But please do. Light sputtered before me, and I blinked at the blinding ball of Faylight. I saw the twin ravens first, that Faylight at their shoulder, to illuminate me for their taking. Their attention went to me, then rose over my shoulder, my head. Absolute, unfiltered terror filled their faces at what stood behind me. Close your eyes. The thing purred in my ear. I obeyed, trembling. Then all I heard was screaming, high-pitched shrieking and pleading, bones snapping, blood splattering like rain, cloth ripping and screaming, screaming, screaming. I squeezed my eyes shut so hard it hurt, squeezed them shut so hard I was shaking. Then there were warm, rough hands on me, dragging me away, and Cassian's voice at my ear saying, Don't look. Don't look. I didn't. I let him lead me away, just as I felt Reese arrive, felt him land on the floor of the pit so hard the entire mountain shuddered. I opened my eyes then, found him storming towards us, night rippling off him, such fury on his face. Get them out. The order was given to Cassian, the screaming still erupting behind us. I lurched towards Reese, but he was already gone, a plume of darkness spreading from him, to shield the view of what he walked into, knowing I would look. The screaming stopped. In the terrible silence, Cassian hauled me out, toward the dim centre of the pit. Nestor was standing there, arms around herself, eyes wide. Cassian only stretched out an arm for her. As if in a trance, she walked right to his side. His arms tightened around both of us, siphons flaring, gilding the darkness with blood-red light. Then we launched skyward, just as the screaming began anew. Chapter 32 Cassian gave us both a glass of brandy, a tall glass. Seated in an armchair in the family library high above, Nestor drank hers in one gulp. I claimed the chair across from her, took a sip, shuddered at the taste, and made to set it down on the low-lying table between us. Keep drinking, Cassian ordered. The wrath wasn't toward me. No, it was toward whatever was below. What had happened? Are you hurt? Cassian asked me. Each word was clipped, brutal. I shook my head. That he didn't ask Nestor, he must have found her first, ascertained for himself. I started. Is the king, the city? No sign of him. A muscle twitched in his jaw. We sat in silence, until Reese appeared between the open doors, shadows trailing in his wake. Blood coated his hands, but nothing else. So much blood, ruby bright in the mid-morning sun like he'd clawed through them with his bare hands. His eyes were wholly frozen with rage. But they dipped to my left arm, the sleeve filthy but still rolled up. Like a slim band of black iron around my forearm, a tattoo now lay there. 
It's custom in my court for bargains to be permanently marked on flesh, Reese had told me under the mountain. What did you give it? I hadn't heard that voice since the visit to the Court of Nightmares. It... It said it wanted company, someone to tell it about life. I said yes. Did you volunteer yourself? No. I drained the rest of the brandy at the tone, his frozen face. It just said someone, and it didn't specify when. I grimaced at the solid black band, no thicker than the width of my finger, interrupted only by two slender gaps near the side of my forearm. I tried to stand, to go to him, to take those bloody hands, but my knees still wobbled enough that I couldn't move. Are the king's ravens dead? They nearly were when I arrived. It left enough of their minds functioning for me to have a look, and finish them when I was done. Cassian was stone-faced, glancing between Reese's bloody hands and his ice-cold eyes. But it was to my sister that my mate turned. Highburn hunts you because of what you took from the cauldron. The queens want you dead for vengeance, for robbing them of immortality. I know. Nestor's voice was hoarse. What did you take? I don't know. The words were barely more than a whisper. Even Amran can't figure it out. Rhys stared her down, but Nesta looked to me, and I could have sworn fear shown there, and guilt, and some other feeling. You told me to run. You're my sister, was all I said. She'd once tried to cross the wall to save me. But she started. Elaine. Elaine is fine, Rhys said. Asriel was at the townhouse. Lucian is headed back, and Moore is nearly there. They know of the threat. Nesta leaned her head back against the armchair's cushion, going a bit boneless. I said to Reese, Highburn infiltrated our city. Again. The prick held onto that fleeting spell until he really needed it. Fleeting spell? A spell of mighty power, able to be wielded only once, to great effect. One capable of cleaving wards. He must have been biding his time. Are the wards here? Amran is currently adapting them against such things, and will then begin combing through the city to find if the king also deposited any other cronies before he vanished. Beneath the cold rage there was a sharpness, honed enough that I said, What's wrong? What's wrong? he replied verbally, as if he could no longer distinguish between the two. What's wrong is those pieces of shit got into my house and attacked my mate. What's wrong is that my own damn wards worked against me, and you had to make a bargain with that thing to keep yourself from being taken. What's wrong- Calm down, I said quietly, but not weakly. His eyes glowed, like lightning had struck an ocean, but he inhaled deeply, blowing out the breath through his nose, and his shoulders loosened, barely. Did you see what it was, that thing down there? I guessed enough about it to close my eyes, he said. I only opened them when it had stepped away from their bodies. Cassian's skin turned ashen. He had seen it. He'd seen it again. But he said nothing. Yes, the king got past our defences, I said to Rhys. Yes, things went badly. But we weren't hurt, and the ravens revealed some key pieces of information. Sloppy, I realised. Reese had been sloppy in killing them. Normally, he would have kept them alive for Asriel to question, but he'd taken what he needed, quickly and brutally, and ended it. He'd shown more restraint about the Ator. We know why the cauldron doesn't work at its full strength now, I went on. We know that Nestor is more of a priority for the king than I am. Reese mulled it over. Highburn showed part of his hand in bringing them here. He has to have a slither of doubt of his conquest if he'd risk it. Nesta looked like she was going to be sick. Cassian wordlessly refilled her glass, but I asked, How... how did you know that we were in trouble? Clotho, Rhys said. There's a spelled bell inside the library. She rang it, and it went out to all of us. Cassian got there first. I wondered what had happened in those initial moments, when he'd found my sister. As if he'd read my thoughts, Rhys sent the image to me, no doubt courtesy of Cassian. Panic and rage, 
That was all he knew as he shot down into the heart of the pit, spearing for that ancient darkness that had once shaken him to his very marrow. Nesta was there, and Feyre. It was the former he saw first, stumbling out of the dark, wide-eyed, her fear a tang that wetted his rage into something so sharp he could barely think, barely breathe. She let out a small, animal sound, like some wounded stag, as she saw him. As he landed so hard his knees popped. He said nothing as Nesta launched herself toward him, her dress filthy and dishevelled, her arms stretching for him. He opened his own for her, unable to stop his approach, his reaching. She gripped his leathers instead. Feyre, she rasped, pointing behind her with a free hand, shaking him solidly with the other. Strength, such untapped strength in that slim, beautiful body. Highburn. That was all he needed to hear. He drew his sword, then Rhys was arrowing for them, his power like a goddamn volcanic eruption. Cassian charged ahead into the gloom, following the screaming. I pulled away, not wanting to see any further, see what Cassian had witnessed down there. Rhys strode to me and lifted a hand to brush my hair, but stopped upon seeing the blood crusting his fingers. He instead studied the tattoo now marring my left arm. As long as we don't have to invite it to solstice dinner, I can live with it. You can live with it, I lifted my brows, a ghost of a smile, even with all that had happened that now lay before us. At least now, if one of you misbehaves, I know the perfect punishment, going down there to talk to that thing for an hour. Nesta scowled with distaste. But Cassian let out a dark laugh. I'll take scrubbing toilets, thank you. Your second encounter seemed less harrowing than the first. It wasn't trying to eat me this time. But Shadow still darkened his eyes. Rhys saw them too. Saw them and said quietly, again, with that High Lord's voice, Warn whoever needs to know to stay indoors tonight. Children off the streets at sundown. None of the palaces will remain open past moonrise. Anyone on the streets will face consequences. Of what? I asked, the liquor in my stomach now burning. Reese's jaw tightened, and he surveyed the sparkling city beyond the windows. Of Amran on the hunt. Elaine was nestled beside a too casual moor on the sitting-room couch when we arrived at the townhouse. Nesta strode past me right to Elaine and took up a seat on her other side, before turning her attention to where we remained in the foyer, waiting, somehow sensing the meeting that was about to unfold. Lucian, stationed by the front window, turned from watching the street, monitoring it. A sword and a dagger hung from his belt. No humour, no warmth graced his face, only fierce, grim determination. Asriel's coming down from the roof, Rhys said to none of us in particular leaning against the archway into the sitting-room and crossing his arms, and, as if he'd been summoned, Asriel stepped out of a pocket of shadow by the stairs and scanned us from head to toe. His eyes lingered on the blood crusting Reese's hands. I took up a spot at the opposite doorway post while Cassian and Asriel remained between us. Reese was quiet for a moment before he said, "'The priestesses will keep silent about what happened today.' and the people of this city won't learn why Amran is now preparing to hunt. We can't afford to let the other High Lords know. It would unnerve them, and destabilise the image we have worked so hard to create. The attack on Valaris, more countered from her place on the couch, already showed we're vulnerable. That was a surprise attack, which we handled quickly, Cassian said, siphons flickering, as made sure the information came out portraying us as victors, able to defeat any challenge Highburn throws our way. We did that today, I said. It's different, Rhys said. The first time, we had the element of surprise to excuse us. This second time, it makes us look unprepared, vulnerable. We can't risk that getting out before the meeting in ten days. So, for all appearances, we will remain unruffled as we prepare for war. Moore sagged against the couch cushions, a war where we have no allies beyond Kier, either in Perithian or beyond it. Rhys gave her a sharp look, but Elaine said quietly, The Queen might come. Silence. 
Elaine was staring at the unlit fireplace, eyes lost to that vague murkiness. What queen? Nesta said, more tightly than she usually spoke to our sister. The one who was cursed. Cursed by the cauldron, I clarified to Nesta, pushing off the archway, when it threw its tantrum after you left. No, Elaine studied me, then her. Not that one, the other. Nesta took a steadying breath, opening her mouth to either whisk Elaine upstairs or move on. But Asriel asked softly, taking a single step over the threshold and into the sitting room. What other? Elaine's brows twitched toward each other. The queen, with the feathers of flame. The shadow singer angled his head. Lucian murmured to me, eyes still fixed on Elaine. Should we? Does she need? She doesn't need anything, Asriel answered without so much as looking at Lucian. Elaine was staring at the spymaster now, unblinkingly. We're the ones who need. Asriel trailed off. A seer, he said, more to himself than us. The cauldron made you a seer.